Hey, just dropping in to say we're now on Patreon. If you want to support the project, head on over to patreon.com slash legal listening, where you can unlock some fun bonus content with me, Zach, and some special guests. Thanks so much for all your support. Hey, welcome to Legal Listening, where audio obiter is our thing. We're Carly and Zach, and we're so glad you're here with us today. So today on the podcast, we have something for our civil law friends. We have the lengthy but fabulous and very interesting decision of C.M. Callow Incorporated and Zollinger. And so this is a contract law decision which sort of delves into our duty of good faith. It's sort of part of a bunch of decisions the court's been releasing recently in line with Matthews and Ocean Spray Canada and Uber and Heller. So lots of discussion about contract law and how contracts work. So Zach, do you know anything about this one? So I haven't read this one, but the general discussion of like the duty of good faith and stuff all is all learned as a first year law student, when you take contract classes, at least in the common law um, yes. schools, I am i will not speak for Quebec in the civil law programs. I'm sure it's different because they have a civil code for contracts. But anyways, um, Carly and I were kind of pre chatting before this one. And I'm so thankful Carly is my partner on this, <laughs> because apparently, it's a very long one. And it yeah. doesn't surprise me. Contract law can be extremely nuanced. Yes. And requires what I would say a uh, a very detail oriented approach. Now, if that doesn't sound like a law school like one liner, I don't know what <laughs> does. That yeah, I mean, lots of these contract decisions are definitely like hundred percent brain activities, just to like sit there and try to get through the nuance of what they're saying. And yeah, I must say this is pretty lengthy. I mean, it's no carbon pricing decision lengthy, uh, but it's Uber and Heller lengthy, which is still pretty lengthy. And the reason why it is so lengthy is because the court does this really neat thing in the decision. So essentially, what's really happening is Bassin and Hrynu is sort of being interpreted in a new context involving a contract involving maintenance services with condos. And in this interpretation of Bassin and Hrynu, We have the majority saying, you know, they violated the duty of honest contractual performance. And the the concurring opinion says similar. Yes, they violated this duty. But where they sort of disagree is the how of how they sort of get there. Uh, The dissenting opinion of Justice Cote is obviously very different. She's very outspoken in terms of her belief in the freedom of contract. So she thought that, uh, you know, nothing was violated and everything was fine. But in terms of the majority, they go into sort of very extensive detail about these types of rules in Quebec in the civil code. And they take a lot from the civil code of Quebec and sort of this bi analysis. And it goes into it very extensively. And then the concurring opinion says, you know, wh- why did you do that? You didn't have to, right? Like we already have Bassin and Hrynu. It states that there's a duty of honest contractual performance. All of this other bi analysis is unnecessary. And I believe they imply it's also, you know, actively bad, right? Because you can't be pulling in... I think one of the points that the concurring uh, decision makes is that you, you can't be pulling in all this jurisprudence from the civil code when many practitioners in Ontario don't even speak the language in order to be able to look it up. And I was just like, well... I don't speak French, so that's certainly fair. So, yeah, it's definitely yes. interesting. Yeah, they, you know, you have a majority and a concurring opinion come to the same conclusion, but very much disagree on sort of the an analytical reasoning as to how you get there. Yeah, and I think it's it's interesting. Uh, contract law, I... <laughs> I frequently joke to all my to all the law students that are listening, if you don't do well in a class, it doesn't mean anything else later on in life. I did not do well in 1L contracts. That's a very well-known fact about me. But looking back on it, I did learn a lot, and my grades didn't necessarily reflect what I learned. So bringing it back to the case and discussing um, duty of good faith and things like that, these are the building blocks that you learn from 1L that you use to apply to cases like this that come out. And I'm just going to take a shot in the dark. My instinct is this one's going to find its way onto a syllabus soon. 
because I think there's a lot of good discussion in here about those concepts from um, Bassin and Heinru that need to be extrapolated and explored more, especially as a student. And if you're leaning into the academic side of things. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's already on. My brother read it and went all contracts at Queen's. Oh, there yeah. we go. <laughs> so, Look yeah, at that. it's already on the syllabus at Queen's. So there you go. It's definitely all. It's crazy, actually, how fast that works, how, you know whatever, three years ago, four years ago, when we took 1L contracts, it was like Bass and Hrynu is it. And then sort of since then, the court has actually released a bunch of uh, jurisprudence in and around this duty of good faith and honest contractual performance. And it's been interesting to see uh, the, the, the steps the law takes, right? Like once you Definitely. stop learning it. Yeah, it's really interesting. But yeah, so this one can be a bit of a slog. Uh, they're lengthy, but they're actually very well written and interesting. And certainly... If you ever need any sort of analysis about bi-jural reasoning and why it is good or why it is not, this is definitely the decision for you because the court gets into that very extensively. And otherwise, it is absolutely solid going into duties of good faith and duties of honest contractual performance. So with that, we hope you enjoy. C.M. Callow Incorporated and Zollinger, Supreme Court of Canada. Heard December 6th, 2019, December 18th, 2020. On appeal from the Court of Appeal for Ontario. The judgment of Chief Justice Wagner and Justices Abella, Karakatsanis, Martin, and Kazurir was delivered by Justice Kazurir. Part 1. Introduction. This appeal concerns a clause in a commercial winter maintenance agreement that permitted the clients to terminate the contract unilaterally, without cause, upon giving the contractor 10 days' notice. The dispute does not turn on whether the clause represented a fair bargain between the parties. There is also no issue about the meaning of the termination clause. The dispute turns rather on the manner in which the respondents, collectively Baycrest, exercised the termination clause. Acknowledging that 10 days notice was given, the appellant, CM Callow Incorporated, Callow, argues that Baycrest exercised the termination clause contrary to the requirements of good faith set forth by this court in Bassan and Hrainu, in particular the duty to perform the contract honestly. In Bassan, Justice Cromwell recognized a general organizing principle of good faith, which means that parties generally must perform their contractual duties honestly and reasonably and not capriciously or arbitrarily. This organizing principle, he explained, quote, is not a freestanding rule, but rather a standard that underpins and is manifested in more specific legal doctrines, and may be given different weight in different situations." End quote. The organizing principle of good faith manifests itself through existing doctrines addressing the types of situations and relationships in which the law requires, in certain respects, honest, candid, forthright, or reasonable contractual performance. In this appeal, the applicable good faith doctrine is the duty of honesty in contractual performance. As Justice Cromwell explained in Basson at paragraph 73, the duty of honesty applies to all contracts as a matter of contractual doctrine and means, quote, simply that parties must not lie or otherwise knowingly mislead each other about matters directly linked to the performance of the contract, end quote. Callow says Baycraft's failure to exercise its right to terminate in keeping with the mandatory duty of honest performance amounted to a breach of contract. It points to the trial judge's findings that Baycrest withheld the information that the contract was in danger of termination. Baycrest then continued to represent that the contract was not in danger and knowingly declined to correct the false impression it had created under which Callow was operating. This dishonesty continued for several months in anticipation of the notice period, wrote the trial judge, and, claims Callow, resulted in it foregoing the opportunity to bid on other winter contracts and thereby justifies an award of damages. Baycrest, for its part, recalling that Justice Cromwell explicitly stated in Basson that the duty of honest performance does not amount to a duty to disclose, argues that its silence does not constitute dishonesty. It also says the alleged dishonesty was not connected to the contract in place at the time because in its submission, the impugned communications related to the possibility of a future contract not yet executed. The Court of Appeal agreed and overturned the trial judge's decision. I respectfully disagree with the Court of Appeal, 
on whether the manner in which the termination clause was exercised ran afoul of the minimum standard of honesty. The duty to act honestly in the performance of the contract precludes active deception. Baycrest breached its duty by knowingly misleading Callow into believing the winter maintenance agreement would not be terminated. By exercising the termination clause dishonestly, it breached the duty of honesty on a matter directly linked to the performance of the contract, even if the 10-day notice period was satisfied and irrespective of their motive for termination. For the reasons that follow, I would allow the appeal and restore the judgment of the Ontario Superior Court of Justice. Part 2. Background. Baycrest includes 10 condominium corporations managed by Condominium Management Group and a designated property manager. Each corporation has its own board of directors to manage its affairs, and collectively they establish a Joint Use Committee, JUC. The JUC makes decisions regarding the joint and shared assets of the condominiums. In 2010, the condominium corporations entered into a two-year winter maintenance agreement with Callow, a corporation owned and operated by Christopher Callow. Pursuant to the terms of the agreement, Callow provided winter services, including snow removal, to the condominium corporations. At the conclusion of the two-year term in 2012, the corporations entered into two new agreements with Callow. Joseph Piexoto, president of one of the condominium corporations, and representative on the JUC, negotiated the main pricing terms with Mr. Callow for the renewal of the winter maintenance contract, which also added a separate summer maintenance services contract. At issue in this appeal is the winter maintenance agreement, which had a new two-winter term from November 1, 2012 to April 30, 2014. Pursuant to Clause 9, the corporations were entitled to terminate the winter maintenance agreement if Callow failed to give satisfactory service in accordance with the terms of this agreement. Moreover, Clause 9 provided that if for any other reason, Callow's services are no longer required for this whole or part of the property covered by this agreement, then the condominium corporations may terminate this contract upon giving 10 days' notice in writing to Callow. During the first winter of the two-winter term, There were complaints from occupants of various condominiums, many of which related to snow removal from individual parking stalls. In January 2013, Mr. Callow attended a JUC meeting to address the concerns. The minutes reflected the positive nature of this meeting, recording that, quote, the committee confirms that Callow has been diligent in addressing this issue as best as could be expected considering the nature of the storms recently experienced, end quote. After the meeting, the property manager at the time also sent a follow-up email to the JUC members. Quote, I know that your board has been generally satisfied with the snow removal, so there is nothing outstanding to report here, end quote. A few months later, still in the first year of the agreement, respondent Tammy Zollinger became the property manager. About three weeks after Ms. Zollinger's arrival, another JUC meeting was held, this time without Mr. Callow present. During the meeting, Ms. Solinger advised the JUC to terminate the winter maintenance agreement with Callow due to poor workmanship in the 2012-2013 winter. The minutes went on to indicate that Ms. Solinger had reviewed the contract and advised the JUC members that they could terminate the contract with Callow with no financial penalty. Ms. Solinger further advised that she would get quotes from other snow removal contractors. The JUC voted to terminate the winter maintenance agreement shortly thereafter, in either March or April of 2013. Baycrest chose not to inform Mr. Callow of its decision to terminate the winter maintenance agreement at that time. Although only one winter of the two-winter term had been completed, Callow began discussions throughout the spring and summer of 2013 with Baycrest regarding a renewal of the winter maintenance agreement. Specifically, Mr. Callow had various exchanges with two condominium corporation board members, one of whom was Mr. Piexoto. Following these conversations, wrote the trial judge, quote, Mr. Callow thought that he was likely to get a two-year renewal of his winter maintenance services contract, and they were satisfied with his services, end quote. Meanwhile, Callow continued to fulfill its obligations under the winter and summer maintenance agreement, including pursuant to the latter arrangement, finishing spring cleanup, 
cutting grass on a weekly basis, and conducting garbage pickup. Furthermore, during the summer of 2013, Callow, quote, performed work above and beyond its summer maintenance services contract, end quote, even doing what Mr. Callow described as some freebie work, which he hoped would act as an incentive for Baycrest to renew the winter maintenance agreement at the end of the upcoming winter. Conversations between Callow and Mr. Piexoto continued into July 2013, at which time Callow decided to improve the appearance of two gardens. In an email dated July 17, 2013, Mr. Piexoto wrote to another condominium corporation board member regarding this freebie work, writing in part, quote, It's nice he's doing it, but I'm sure it's an attempt at us keeping him. By the way, I was talking to him last week as well, and he's under the impression we're keeping him for winter again. I didn't say a word to him because I don't want to get involved, but I did tell Ms. Zollinger that Mr. Callow thinks we're keeping him for the winter, end quote. Baycrest did not inform Callow about the decision to terminate the winter maintenance agreement until September 12, 2013. At that point, Ms. Solinger advised Callow by way of email, quote, that Baycrest will not be requiring your services for the winter contract of the 2013-2014 season as per Section 9 of the contract. Baycrest needs to provide the contractor with 10 days' notice, end quote. Callow consequently filed a statement of claim for breach of contract, alleging that Baycrest acted in bad faith by accepting free services while knowing Callow was offering them in order to maintain their future contractual relationship. Moreover, Callow alleged that Baycrest knew or ought to have known that Callow would not seek other winter maintenance contracts in reliance on the representations that Callow was providing satisfactory service and the contract would not be prematurely terminated. Accordingly, quote, as a result of these misrepresentations and or bad faith conduct, Mr. Callow, on behalf of Callow, did not bid on other tenders for winter maintenance contracts. Baycrest is now liable for Callow's damages for loss of opportunity, end quote, from the appeal record. Finally, Callow alleged that Baycrest was unjustly enriched by the free services it provided in the summer of 2013. Callow sought damages in the amount of $81,383.68 for breach of contract, an amount equivalent to the one year remaining on the winter maintenance agreement, damages for intentional interference with contractual relations, including breach of contract, and negligent misrepresentation. It also asked for damages in the amount of $5,000 for unjust enrichment, an amount equivalent to the freebie work, and pre- and post-judgment interest and costs on a substantial indemnity basis. Part 3. Prior Decisions Subpart A. Ontario Superior Court of Justice Justice Obonsowin In her review of the circumstances of the dispute, the trial judge commented on the testimony of several key witnesses, including that Mr. Callow was a credible witness. In contrast, she found that Baycrest's witnesses, including a former property manager, as well as Mr. Zollinger and Mr. Piexoto, had provided many exaggerations, overstatements, and constantly provided comments contrary to the written evidence. The trial judge thus preferred Mr. Callow's version of events to that of Baycrest. At trial, Baycrest advanced two main submissions. First, it argued that, as a matter of simple contractual interpretation, Clause 9 clearly and unambiguously states that it could terminate the contract for any reason by providing Callow with 10 days' notice in writing. Second, even though no cause had to be shown to invoke Clause 9, Baycrest nonetheless argued that the evidence before the trial judge demonstrated that Callow's level of service did not comply with the contractual specifications and was not to its complete satisfaction. The trial judge dismissed both arguments. First, she found that Callow's work met the requisite standard. While there were complaints about Callow's work, she observed that, quote, a significant portion related to the clearing of parking stalls, which was the fault of the owners and tenants who did not move their vehicles, end quote. Was the quality of Callow's work below standard, asked the trial judge? The evidence leads me, she wrote, to answer no. Second, the trial judge held that this was not a simple contractual interpretation case. In her view, the organizing principle of good faith performance and the duty of honest performance were engaged. The trial judge explained that as Justice Cromwell noted in Basson, 
the duty of honest performance should not be confused with the duty of disclosure. However, she wrote, quote, contracting parties must be able to rely on a minimum standard of honesty and to ensure that parties will have a fair opportunity to protect their interests if the contract does not work out, end quote. For the purposes of drawing a distinction between the failure to disclose a material fact and active dishonesty, the trial judge observed that, quote, unless there is active deception, there is no unilateral duty to disclose information before the notice period, end quote. The trial judge was satisfied that Baycrest actively deceived Callow from the time the termination decision was made in March or April 2013 to the time when notice was given on September 12, 2013. Specifically, she found that Baycrest acted in bad faith by 1. withholding the information to ensure Callow performed the summer maintenance services contract, and 2. continuing to represent that the contract was not in danger despite Baycrest's knowledge that Callow was taking on extra tasks to bolster the chances of renewing the winter maintenance services contract. Given the active communications between the parties during the summer of 2013, which deceived Callow, the trial judge did not accept Baycrest's argument that no duty was owed to disclose the decision to terminate the contract before the notice. The minimum standard of honesty, she concluded, would have been to address the alleged performance issues to provide prompt notice, or to refrain from any representations in anticipation of the notice period. The trial judge tied Baycrest's dishonesty to the way in which it delayed invocation of the 10-day notice period set out in Clause 9, while it actively deceived Callow that the contract was not in jeopardy. Her reasons relied upon by analogy, the law recognizing a duty to exchange good faith in the manner of dismissal when terminating an employee. She noted that Baycrest intentionally withheld the information in bad faith. She expressly acknowledged that exercising a termination clause is not in itself evidence of a breach of good faith. However, in this case, Baycrest deliberately deceived Callow about the termination, which was a breach of the duty of honest performance. By reason of this contractual breach, the trial judge awarded damages to Callow in order to place it in the same position as if the breach had not occurred. These damages amounted to $64,306.96, a sum equivalent to the value of the winter maintenance agreement for one year, minus expenses that Callow would typically incur. A further amount of $14,835.14 representing the value of one year of a lease of equipment that Callow would not have leased if it had known the winter maintenance was to be terminated, and $1,600 for the final invoice for the summer work, which Baycrest had failed to pay Callow. Costs were awarded to Callow. The trial judge was also satisfied that Baycrest was unjustly enriched due to the freebie work performed by Callow during the summer of 2013. She declined, however, to award damages for the unjust enrichment since Callow failed to provide evidence of its expenses. Subpart B. Court of Appeal for Ontario. Appeal Justices Lowers, Huscroft, and Trotter. Baycrest appealed, arguing that the trial judge erred in two respects. First, it alleged she erred by improperly expanding the duty of honest performance beyond the terms of the winter maintenance agreement. Second, it argued that the trial judge erred in assessing damages. The Court of Appeal unanimously agreed with Baycrest on the first point and set aside the judgment at first instance. The Court of Appeal recognized, as the trial judge had found, that the directors of two of the condominium corporations and members of the JUC were aware that Mr. Callow was performing freebie work and knew he was under the impression that the contracts were likely to be renewed. Nonetheless, the court stressed that Bassin was a modest incremental step and good faith is to be applied in a manner so as to avoid commercial uncertainty. As such, the duty of honesty does not impose a duty of loyalty or of disclosure or to require a party to forego advantages flowing from the contract. The Court of Appeal further emphasized that Callow had made two concessions in its factum. First, Callow acknowledged that Baycrest was not contractually required to disclose its decision to terminate the winter maintenance agreement prior to the 10-day notice period, 
Second, Callow acknowledged that the failure to provide notice on a more timely basis was not, in and of itself, evidence of bad faith. Because there is no unilateral duty to disclose information relevant to termination, the court reasoned Baycrest was free to terminate the winter contract with Callow, provided only that it informed him of its intention to do so and gave the required notice. That is all that Callow bargained for and all that he was entitled to. While the trial judge's findings may well suggest a failure to act honorably, the Court of Appeal expressed its view that the findings do not rise to the high level required to establish a breach of the duty of honest performance. In any event, the Court of Appeal said that any deception in the communications during the summer of 2013 related to a new contract not yet in existence, namely the renewal that Callow hoped to negotiate. Accordingly, in its view, any deception could not be said to be directly linked to the performance of the winter contract. Given the Court of Appeals' conclusion, it did not address damages. Part 4. Analysis. Subpart A. Overview of the Appeal. This appeal presents this court with an opportunity to clarify what constitutes a breach of the duty of honest performance, where it manifests itself in connection with the exercise of a seemingly unfettered, unilateral termination clause. Pointing to what it calls Baycrest's active deception in the exercise of the clause, Callow says this contract was a breach of the duty of honest performance recognized in Basson. Before this court, Callow does not dispute the meaning of Clause 9, nor does Callow's argument on appeal concern the adequacy of the bargain struck with Baycrest or whether the termination was unjustified. Callow is not saying, for instance, that it should have been afforded more notice because the 10-day period was unfair in the circumstances. I recognize that at trial, there was some question as to whether the termination was fitting given Callow's work record. Indeed, the trial judge found in Callow's favor on this point, concluding that it had provided satisfactory services. But the suggestions that Callow was terminated for some improper purpose or motive, or even that the termination was unreasonable, need not be determined on this appeal. The narrow question addressed here is whether Baycrest failed to satisfy its duty not to lie or knowingly deceive Callow about matters directly linked to the performance of the winter maintenance agreement, specifically by exercising the termination clause as it did. In the present circumstances, Callow says Baycrest misled Mr. Callow about the possible renewal of the winter maintenance agreement, and, as a result, it knowingly deceived him into thinking it was satisfied with Callow's performance of the agreement than in force for the upcoming winter season. Callow says it mistakenly inferred, as a consequence of this dishonesty, that there was no danger of the existing winter contract being terminated pursuant to Clause 9 of the contract. This, Callow submits, was to the full knowledge of Baycrest, who failed to correct its false impression which amounted to a breach of the duty of honest performance. In short, Callow says this deceitful conduct meant the exercise of the termination clause was wrongful in that it was breached even if, strictly speaking, the required notice was given. This should give rise, claims Callow, to compensatory damages on the ordinary measure as the trial judge had ordered. Damages for lost profits, wasted expenditures, and an unpaid invoice. In addition to the duty of honest performance, Callow invokes a freestanding duty to exercise contractual discretionary powers in good faith, which, it argues, Justice Cromwell also recognized in Basson, and which would justify the same award in damages. Furthermore, in the event the court disagrees that there has been a breach of one or another of those existing duties, Callow submits, alternatively, that this court should recognize a new duty of good faith which would prohibit active non-disclosure. In answer, Baycrest notes the concessions made by Callow before the Court of Appeal, specifically that Clause 9 on its face did not require it to give more notice. Baycrest agrees with the Court of Appeal that whatever communications took place between the parties, those communications concerned a future contract and were not directly related to the performance of the winter contract then in force. The agreement granted Baycrest an unqualified right to terminate the contract on notice for any reason 
which is precisely what occurred. Recalling that the duty to act honestly in performance is not a duty of disclosure and does not impose a duty of loyalty akin to that of a fiduciary, Baycrest says that Callow seeks to have it subvert its own interest by requiring it to inform Callow of its intention to end the winter maintenance agreement before the stipulated 10 days' notice. The Court of Appeal was thus correct in concluding that the bargain struck by the parties entitled Baycrest to end the contract as it did. In a similar vein, with respect to the duty to exercise discretionary powers in good faith, Baycrest says that because it respected the terms of the contract, the issue of abuse of contractual discretion does not arise on the facts of this case. In any event, Baycrest emphasizes the conclusion reached by the Court of Appeal that any discussions in the spring and summer of 2013 that may have misled Callow were connected to pre-contractual negotiations. Thus, any dishonesty can be said to be directly linked to the performance of the winter maintenance agreement. The appeal should be allowed. I respectfully disagree with the Court of Appeal on two main points. First, Basson is clear that even though Baycrest had what was, on its face, an unfettered right to terminate the winter maintenance agreement on 10 days' notice, the right had to be exercised in keeping with the duty to act honestly, i.e. Baycrest could not lie or otherwise knowingly mislead Callow about matters directly linked to the performance of the contract. According to the Court of Appeal, any dishonesty was about a renewal, which was in turn connected to pre-contractual negotiations to which the duty, as stated in Basson, does not apply. I respectfully disagree. In my view, the Court of Appeal may have erroneously framed the trial judge's findings at paragraph 6, writing that she found that Baycrest had represented that the winter contract was not in danger of non-renewal. Referring instead to the ongoing winter services agreement, the trial judge had found Baycrest misrepresented that the contract was not in danger, despite Baycrest's knowing that Callow was taking on extra tasks to bolster the chances of renewing the winter maintenance services contract. In determining whether dishonesty is connected to a given contract, the relevant question is generally whether a right under that contract was exercised, or an obligation under that contract was performed dishonestly. As I understand it, the trial judge's finding was that the dishonesty in this case was related not to a future contract, but to the termination of the winter maintenance agreement. If someone is led to believe that their counterparty is content with their work and their ongoing contract is likely to be renewed, it is reasonable for that person to infer that the ongoing contract is in good standing and will not be terminated early. This is what the trial judge found. Simply said, Baycrest's alleged deception was directly linked to this contract because its exercise of the termination clause in this contract was dishonest. Second, the Court of Appeal erred when it concluded that the trial judge's findings did not amount to a breach of the duty of honest performance. While the duty of honest performance is not to be equated with a positive obligation of disclosure, this, too, does not exhaust the question as to whether Baycrest's conduct constituted, as a breach of the duty of honesty, a wrongful exercise of the termination clause. Baycrest may not have had a freestanding obligation to disclose its intention to terminate the contract before the mandated 10 days' notice, but it nonetheless had an obligation to refrain from misleading Callow in the exercise of that clause. In circumstances where a party lies to or knowingly misleads another, a lack of a positive obligation of disclosure does not preclude an obligation to correct the false impression created through its own actions. In light of these points, it is my view that this is not a simple contractual interpretation case bearing on the meaning to be given to Clause 9. Nor is this a case involving passive failure to disclose a material fact. Instead, as recognized by the Court of Appeal, not only did Baycrest fail to inform Callow of its decision to terminate, it actively deceived Callow as to its intentions and accepted the freebie work it performed, in the knowledge that this extra work was performed with the intention and hope of persuading Baycrest to award Callow additional contracts once the present contracts expired. <laughs>
while Baycrest was not required to subvert its legitimate contractual interests to those of Callow in respect of the existing winter services agreement. It could not, as it did, undermine those interests in bad faith. For the reasons that follow, this dispute can be resolved on the basis of the first ground of appeal relating to the duty of honest performance. Baycrest knowingly misled Callow in the manner in which it exercised Clause 9 of the agreement, and this wrongful exercise of the termination clause amounts to a breach of contract under Basson. In the circumstances, I find it unnecessary to answer Callow's argument that, irrespective of the question of honesty, Baycrest breached a duty to exercise a discretionary power in good faith. Nor is it necessary to extend Basson to recognize a new duty of good faith relating to what Callow has described as active non-disclosure of information germane to performance. Subpart B. The Duty of Honest Performance 1. The dishonesty is directly linked to the performance of the contract. I turn first to Callow's submission that the Court of Appeal erred in concluding that the dishonesty was not connected to the contract then in effect. As I will endeavor to explain, while Baycrest had the right to terminate, it breached the duty of honest performance in exercising the right as it did. Callow relies on the duty of honest performance in contract formulated in Basson. This duty, which applies to all contracts, requires the parties to be honest with each other in relation to the performance of their contractual obligations. While this formulation of the duty refers explicitly to the performance of contractual obligations, it applies, of course, both to the performance of one's obligations and to the exercise of one's rights under the contract. Justice Cromwell concluded, at paragraphs 94 and 103, that the finding that the non-renewal clause had been exercised dishonestly made out a breach of the duty. Quote, The trial judge made clear a finding of fact that Can-Am acted dishonestly towards Basson in exercising the non-renewal clause. There is no basis to interfere with that finding on appeal. It follows that Can-Am breached its duty to perform the agreement honestly. As the trial judge found, this dishonesty on the part of Can-Am was directly and intimately connected to Can-Am's performance of the agreement with Mr. Basson and its exercise of the non-renewal provision. I conclude that Can-Am breached the 1998 agreement when it failed to act honestly with Mr. Basson in exercising the non-renewal clause, end quote. This same framework for analysis applies to this appeal. The trial judge here made a clear finding of fact that Baycrest acted dishonestly towards Callow by representing that the contract was not in danger, even though a decision to terminate the contract had already been made. There is no basis to interfere with that finding on appeal. As I will explain, it follows that Baycrest deceived Callow and thereby breached its duty of honest performance. I begin by recognizing the debate as to the extent to which good faith, beyond the duty of honesty, should substantively constrain a right to terminate, in particular, one found in contract. For some, the right to terminate is in the nature of an absolute right, insulated from judicial oversight, unlike the exercise of contractual discretion. To this end, I recall that Justice Cromwell observed that, quote, Classifying the decision not to renew the contract as a contractual discretion would constitute a significant expansion of the decided cases under that type of situation. End quote. I need not and do not seek to resolve this debate in this case. I emphasize that Justice Cromwell himself recognized that, regardless of this debate, the non renewal clause could not be exercised dishonestly. Whatever the full range of circumstances to which good faith is relevant to contract law in common law Canada, it is beyond question that the duty of honesty is germane to the performance of this contract, in particular to the way in which the unilateral right to terminate for convenience set forth in Clause 9 was exercised. As a further preliminary matter, I recall that the organizing principle of good faith recognized by Justice Cromwell is not a freestanding rule but instead manifests itself through existing good faith doctrines, and that this list may be incrementally expanded where appropriate. 
In this case, Callow invokes two existing doctrines, the duty of honest performance and the duty to exercise discretionary powers in good faith. In my view, properly understood, the duty to act honestly about matters directly linked to the performance of the contract, the exercise of the termination clause, is sufficient to dispose of this appeal. No expansion of the law set forth in Basson is necessary to find in favor of Callow. Rather, this appeal provides an opportunity to illustrate this existing doctrine that, I say respectfully, was misconstrued by the Court of Appeal. While these two existing doctrines are indeed distinct, like each of the different manifestations of the organizing principle, they should not be thought of as disconnected from one another. Justice Cromwell explained that good faith contractual performance is a shared requirement of justice that underpins and informs the various rules recognized by the common law on obligations of good faith contractual performance. The organizing principle of good faith was intended to correct the piecemeal approach to good faith in the common law, which too often failed to take a consistent or principled approach to similar problems, and instead, develop the law in this area in a coherent and principled way. By insisting upon the thread that ties the good faith doctrines together, expressed through the organizing principle, Courts will put an end to the very piecemeal and incoherent development of good faith doctrine in the common law against which Justice Cromwell sought to guard. While the duty of honest performance might bear some resemblance to the law of misrepresentation, for example, in a way that good faith in other settings may not, Basson encourages us to examine how other existing good faith doctrines, distinct but nonetheless connected, can be used as helpful analytical tools in understanding how the relatively new duty of honest performance operates in practice. The specific legal doctrines derived from the organizing principle rest on a requirement of justice that a contracting party, like Baycrest here in respect of the contractual duty of honest performance, have appropriate regard to the legitimate contractual interests of their counterparty. It need not, according to Basson, subvert its own interests to those of Callow by acting as a fiduciary or in a selfless manner that would confer a benefit on Callow. To be sure, this requirement of justice reflects the notion that the bargain, the rights and obligations agreed to, is the first source of fairness between parties to a contract. But by the same token, those rights and obligations must be exercised and performed, as stated by the organizing principle, honestly and reasonably and not capriciously or arbitrarily where recognized by law. This requirement of justice, rooted in a contractual ideal of corrective justice, ties the existing doctrines of good faith, including the duty to act honestly, together. The duty of honest performance is but an exemplification of this ideal. Here, based on its failure to perform Clause 9 honestly, Baycrest committed a breach of contract, a civil wrong, for which it has to answer. When, in Basson, Justice Cromwell recognized a duty to act honestly in the performance of contracts, he explained that this duty, quote, should not be thought of as an implied term, but a general doctrine of contract law that imposes as a contractual duty a minimum standard of honest contractual performance, end quote. Characterizing this new duty as a matter of contractual doctrine was appropriate, Justice Cromwell wrote, quote, since parties will rarely expect that their contracts permit dishonest performance of their obligations, end quote. The duty, therefore, applies even where, as in our case, the parties have expressly provided for the modalities of termination given that the duty of good faith operates irrespective of the intentions of the parties. No contractual right, including a termination right, can be exercised dishonestly and, as such, contrary to the requirements of good faith. Justice Cromwell's choice of language is telling. It is not enough to say that, temporarily speaking, dishonesty occurred while both parties were performing their obligations under the contract. Rather, the dishonest or misleading conduct must be directly linked to performance. 
Otherwise, there would simply be a duty not to tell a lie, with little to limit the potentially wide scope of liability. The duty of honest performance is a contract law doctrine, setting it apart from other areas of the law that address the legal consequences of deceit with which it may share certain similarities. One could imagine analyzing the facts given rise to a duty of honest performance claim through the lens of other existing legal doctrines, such as fraudulent misrepresentation giving rise to rescission of the contract or the tort of civil fraud. However, in Basson, Justice Cromwell wrote explicitly that while the duty of honest performance has similarities with civil fraud and estoppel, it is not subsumed by them. For instance, unlike estoppel and civil fraud, the duty of honest performance does not require a defendant to intend that the plaintiff rely on their representation or false statement. Justice Cromwell explicitly defined the duty as a new and distinct doctrine of contract law, not giving rise to tort liability or tort damages, but rather resulting in a breach of contract when violated. We are not asked by the parties to depart from this approach. In light of Basson, then, how is the duty of honest performance appropriately limited? The breach must be directly linked to the performance of the contract. Justice Cromwell observed a contractual breach because Can-Am acted dishonestly towards Basson in exercising the non-renewal clause. He pointed, in particular, to the trial judge's conclusion that Can-Am acted dishonestly with Mr. Basson throughout the period leading up to its exercise of the non-renewal clause. Accordingly, it is a link to the performance of obligations under a contract, or to the exercise of rights set forth therein, that controls the scope of the duty. In a comment on Basson, Professor McCamus underscored this connection. Quote, Justice Cromwell was of the view that the new duty of honesty could be breached in the context of the exercise of a right of non-renewal. That was the holding in Basson, end quote. While the abuse of discretion was not the basis of the damages awarded in Basson, the duty of honest performance shares a common methodology with the duty to exercise contractual discretionary powers in good faith by fixing, at least in circumstances like ours, on the wrongful exercise of a contractual prerogative. Importantly, Callow does not seek to bar Baycrest from exercising the termination clause here. Like in Basson, it only seeks damages flowing from the fact that the clause was exercised dishonestly. In other words, Callow's argument, properly framed, is that Baycrest could not exercise Clause 9 in a manner that breached the duty of honesty, however absolute that right appeared on its face. Good faith is thus not relied upon here to provide, by implication, a new contractual term or a guide to interpretation of language that was somehow an unclear statement of parties' intent. Instead, the duty of honesty as contractual doctrine has a limiting function on the exercise of an otherwise complete and clear right because the duty, irrespective of the intention of the parties, applies to the performance of all contracts and, by extension, to all contractual obligations and rights. This means, simply, that instead of constraining the decision to terminate in and of itself, the duty of honest performance attracts damages where the manner in which the right was exercised was dishonest. The issue, then, is not whether the clause was properly interpreted or whether the bargain itself is inadequate. Moreover, what is important is not the failure to act honestly in the abstract, but whether Baycrest failed to act honestly in exercising Clause 9. Stated simply, no contractual right can be exercised in a dishonest manner because pursuant to Basson, that would be contrary to an imperative requirement of good faith, i.e., not to lie or knowingly deceive one's counterparty in a matter directly linked to the performance of the contract. This argument invites this court to explain if and how Baycrest wrongfully exercised the termination clause, quite apart from any notice requirement. I would add that this focus on the manner in which the termination right was exercised should not be confused with whether the right could be exercised. Callow does not allege that Baycrest did not have the right to terminate the agreement. This entitlement to do so on 10 days notice, pursuant to Clause 9, is not at issue here. However, according to Callow, 
that right was exercised dishonestly, in breach of the duty in Basson, obliging Baycrest to pay damages as a consequence of its behavior. Accordingly, I would draw the same distinction made by Justice Cromwell in Basson regarding the exercise of the non-renewal clause at issue in this case. Quote, Can-Am acted dishonestly towards Mr. Basson in exercising the non-renewal clause as it did, and was liable for damages as a result, but it was not precluded from exercising its prerogative not to renew the contract, end quote. In service of its argument that Baycrest breached the duty of honest performance in its exercise of Clause 9 of the contract, Callow points to references in Basson to Quebec law, and in particular to Justice Cromwell's reference to the theory of the abuse of contractual rights set forth in Articles 6, 7, and 1375 of the Civil Code of Quebec. Callow observes that the requirement not to abuse contractual rights is recognized as a feature of good faith performance in Quebec. It submits that the allusion to the doctrine of abuse of rights was an indication of the requirements of good faith in Basson, and argues that the same framework can usefully illustrate how the common law duty of honesty constrains the termination clause in this case. I agree that looking to Quebec law is useful here. The direct link between the dishonest conduct and the exercise of Clause 9 was not properly identified by the Court of Appeal in this case, and Quebec law helps illustrate the requirement that there be such a link from Basson. In my view, Baycrest's dishonest conduct is not a wrong independent of the termination clause, but a breach of contract that, properly understood, manifested itself upon the exercise of Clause 9. Through that direct link between the dishonesty and the exercise of the clause, the conduct is understood as contrary to the requirements of good faith. This emerges more plainly when considered in light of the civilian doctrine of contractual good faith alluded to in Basson, specifically the fact that in Quebec, the notion of good faith includes but is not limited to the requirement of honesty in performing the contract. Thus, like in Quebec civil law, no contractual right may be exercised dishonestly and therefore contrary to the requirements of good faith. Properly raised by Justice Cromwell, this framework for connecting the exercise of a contractual clause and the requirements of good faith is helpful to illustrate, for the common law, the link made in Basson that the Court of Appeal failed to identify here. Mindful, no doubt, of its unique vantage point, which offers an occasion to observe developments in both the common law and the civil law in its work, This court has often drawn on this country's bi-jural environment to inform its decisions, principally in private law appeals. While this practice has varied over time and has been more prevalent in civil law cases in which common law authorities are considered, the influence of bi-juralism is not and need not be confined to appeals from Quebec or to matters relating to federal legislation. In its modern jurisprudence, This court has recognized the value of looking to legal sources from Quebec in common law appeals, and has often observed how these sources resolve similar legal issues and those faced by the common law. Used in this way, authorities from Quebec do not, of course, bind this court in its disposition of a private law appeal from a common law province, but rather serve as persuasive authority in particular by shedding light on how the jurisprudentially available rules work. In my respectful view, it is uncontroversial that when done carefully, sources of law may be used in this way. As Robert J. Sharp put it, writing extrajudicially, judges should strive to maintain the coherence and integrity of the law as defined by the binding authorities, using persuasive authority to elaborate and flesh out the basic structure. This does not mean The appropriate use of these sources is limited to cases where there is a gap in the law of the jurisdiction in which the appeal originates, in the sense that there is no answer to the legal problem in the law, or where a court contemplates modifying an existing rule. Respectfully said, I am aware of no authority of this court supporting so restrictive an approach, and note that, while unresolved, there are serious debates in both the common law and the civil law as to what exactly a gap in the law might be. Taking this approach would unduly inhibit the ability of this court to understand the law better in reference to how comparable problems are addressed elsewhere in Canada. It would be wrong to disregard potentially helpful material in this way 
merely because of its origin. In private law, comparison between the common law and civil law as they evolve in Canada is a particularly useful and familiar exercise for this court. This exercise of comparison between legal traditions for the purposes of explanation and illustration has been described as worthwhile, useful, and helpful. Principles from the common law or the civil law may serve as a source of inspiration for the other, precisely because these two legal communities have the same broad social values. The common law and the civil law are not the only legal traditions relevant to the work of the court. Yet, the opportunity for dialogue between these legal traditions is arguably a special mandate for this court, given the breadth and responsibilities of its bijural jurisdiction. This opportunity has been underscored in scholarly commentary, including in the field of good faith performance of contracts. Writing extrajudicially, Justice LaBelle has observed that this exercise is part of the function of this court as a national appellate court, adding that, quote, because it has the ability to do so today, thanks to its institutional resources, the Supreme Court now assumes the symbolic responsibility of embracing a culture of dialogue between the two major legal traditions, end quote. This court's unique institutional capacity as the apex court of common law and civil law appeals in Canada allows it to engage in dialogue that makes it more than a court of appeal for each of the provinces. The opportunity for dialogue presents itself specifically in the context of the common law good faith doctrines. Pointing to the writing of Justice LaBelle and how Quebec sources were deployed in Basin, one comparative law scholar wrote recently that while distinctiveness of Canada's legal traditions must be maintained and jealously protected, this need not prevent them from learning from one another. Professor Wadhams has remarked that the reference to Quebec law in Basin is an invitation to consider civil law concepts, including abuse of rights, in the development of the common law relating to good faith. This would be consistent with a broader pattern of more pronounced reciprocal influence between traditions as comparative analysis becomes increasingly prominent in this court's judgments. Indeed, this court has undertaken this exercise in some common law and civil law appeals in which good faith principles are engaged, including Basson itself. Justice Cromwell pointed to the comfort that can be drawn from the experience of the civil law of Quebec, for example, by those common lawyers who fear that a new duty of honest performance would create uncertainty or impede freedom of contract. Justice Cromwell also pointed to substantive points of comparison in support of his analysis of the similarity between implied terms in the common law and good faith in Quebec, as well as on the fact that good faith in Quebec law also includes a requirement of honesty in performing contracts. Strikingly, in one recent Quebec example that is especially relevant here, Justice Gascon, writing for a majority of this court, quoted Basson on the degree to which the organizing principle of good faith exemplifies the notion that a contracting party should have appropriate regard to the legitimate contractual interests of their counterparty. He noted that this statement applies equally to the duty of good faith in Quebec civil law from Churchill Falls Labrador Corporation in Hydro-Quebec. I note this only as an instance of accepted judicial reasoning in this field, where comparisons are rightly said to be difficult. A majority of the court nevertheless invoked a leading common law authority on good faith to illuminate the civil law's distinct treatment as both helpful and persuasive. In the same way, I draw on Quebec civil law in this appeal to illustrate what it means for dishonesty to be directly linked to contractual performance. As I will explain, the civil law framework of abuse of rights helps to focus the analysis of whether the common law duty of honest performance has been breached on what might be called the wrongful exercise of a contractual right. This appeal makes plain a need for clarification on the question of when dishonesty is directly linked to the performance of a contract. The Court of Appeal recognized the duty of honest performance, but concluded that the communications at issue were not directly linked to performance of the existing contract. Quote, communications between the parties may have led Mr. Callow to believe that there would be a new contract, but those communications did not preclude Baycrest from exercising their right to terminate the winter contract then in effect. End quote. 
The court's reasons also conclude that Baycrest could exercise the termination clause, provided only that it informed him of its intention to do so and gave the required notice. That is all Callow bargained for and all that it was entitled to. The Court of Appeal apparently did not consider that the manner in which the termination right was exercised amounted to a breach of the duty to act honestly. This was, for the trial judge in the present appeal, the matter directly linked to the performance of the contract in the dispute with Callow. These diverging conclusions in this case are unsurprising given that this court recognized the duty of honest performance as a new good faith doctrine relatively recently. Nevertheless, the reasons in Basson indicate how the required connection between the dishonesty and performance is made manifest. When Justice Cromwell summarized the new duty, he suggested that it required honesty about matters directly linked to the performance of the contract, and later in relation to the performance of their contractual obligations. But this latter formulation does not, of course, comprehensively describe the required link, not least of all because it speaks of honesty in the performance of an obligation and says nothing about the exercise of a right. Yet, in applying the duty to the facts in Basson, this court concluded that there was a breach of the duty on the basis of the trial judge's finding that Canam acted dishonestly in the exercise of a non-renewal clause. Further, I note that while the duty of honest performance has similarities with the pre-existing common law doctrines of civil fraud and estoppel, these doctrines do not assist in our analysis of the required link to the performance of the contract. The duty of honest performance is a contract law doctrine. It is not a tort. It is its nature as a contract law doctrine that gives rise to the requirement of a nexus with the contractual relationship. While other areas of the law involving dishonesty may be useful to understand what it means to be dishonest, they provide no obvious assistance in determining what is and what is not directly linked to the performance of a contract. In my view, the required direct link between dishonesty and performance from Basson is made plain by way of simple comparison when one considers how the framework for abuse of rights in Quebec connects the manner in which a contractual right is exercised to the requirements of good faith. Specifically, the direct link exists when the party performs their obligation or exercises their right under the contract dishonestly. When read together, Articles 6, 7, and 1375 of the Quebec Civil Code point to this connection by providing that no contractual right may be exercised abusively without violating the requirements of good faith. Article 7 in particular provides, quote, no right may be exercised with the intent of injuring another or in an excessive and unreasonable manner, and therefore contrary to the requirements of good faith, end quote. While the substantive content of this article is not relevant to the common law analysis, the framework is illustrative. This article shows how the requirements of good faith can be tied to the exercise of a right, including a right under a contract. It is the exercise of the right that is scrutinized to assess whether the action has been contrary to good faith. Under the civil law framework of abuse of rights, it is no answer to say that because a right is unfettered on its face, it is insulated from review as to the manner in which it was exercised. Moreover, the doctrine of abuse of rights does not preclude the holder from exercising the contractual right in question. As professors Jobin and Vizina have written on abuse of contractual rights in Quebec, quote, the doctrine of abuse of rights does not lead to the negation of the right as such. Rather, it addresses the use made of the right by its holder, end quote. It has been said that good faith in the civil law has a limiting function in directing standards of ethical conduct to which parties must conform as a matter of imperative law when performing the contract. Quote, it, i.e. the limiting function of good faith, thus seeks to sanction a party's improper conduct in the exercise of the party's contractual prerogatives, end quote. That is what is at stake here, whether the ethical standard expressed in the common law duty to act honestly in performance as a manifestation of the organizing principle of good faith recognized in Basson, limits the manner in which Baycrest can exercise its right to terminate the winter maintenance agreement.
By focusing attention on the exercise of a particular right under a particular contract, a direct link to the performance of that contract is helpfully drawn. Thus, in Houle and Canadian National Bank, a Quebec case cited in Basson at paragraph 85, the contracting party's right to demand repayment of the loan, as stipulated in the contract, was upheld. The abusive right identified by the court was the manner in which the right was exercised. This is, as I have noted, broadly similar to Basson. There, Canam had a contractual right of non-renewal, but Canam nonetheless exercised that right in a dishonest manner, and thus breached the duty of honest performance. This was a wrongful exercise of the right in that it was exercised contrary to the mandatory requirement of good faith performance. There are special reasons, of course, to be cautious in undertaking the comparative exercise to which Callow invites us here. One is that there are important differences between the civilian treatment of abuse of contractual rights and the current state of the common law. The civil code provides that no right may be exercised with the intent to injure another or in an excessive and unreasonable manner, and therefore, contrary to the requirements of good faith requiring that parties conduct themselves in good faith, in particular at the time an obligation is performed. Insofar as the organizing principle in Basson speaks to a related idea that parties generally must perform their contractual duties honestly and reasonably and not capriciously or arbitrarily, this principle, unlike Quebec's law, is not a freestanding rule, but rather a standard that underpins and manifests itself in more specific doctrines. Further, in Basson, positive law was only formally extended by recognizing a general duty of honesty in contractual performance. An additional reason is the common law's fabled reluctance to embrace the standard associated with the civilian idea of abuse of rights, including abuse of contractual rights, a doctrine to which Basson alluded in paragraph 83. Mindful of this, Justice Cromwell recalled, quote, the fundamental commitments of the common law of contract to the freedom of contracting parties to pursue their individual self-interest, end quote, and, importantly to the theory of abuse of rights, that the organizing principle he recognized, quote, should not be used as a pretext for scrutinizing the motives of contracting parties, end quote. Others have observed that the civilian conception of civil rights, droit subjectif in the French tradition, are conceptually different from rights in the common law, or even that the preoccupation with the social dimension of limits to rights, as opposed to a purely economic aspect of a freely negotiated bargain, is peculiar to civil law. Still others have observed the differing techniques for the genesis of new rules of law according to the common law and civil law methods. One should not lose sight of the fact that as intellectual and historical traditions, the common law and the civil law represent, in many respects, distinctive ways of knowing the law. It is true that Justice LaBelle, writing extrajudicially prior to this court's decision in Basson, in which he concurred, noted that in the dialogue between the common law and the civil law in this court's jurisprudence, good faith offered an example of coexistence rather than convergence or divergence. Yet, as he noted, Comparison in this field that respects the intellectual integrity of distinctive traditions remains a viable part of the dialogue between common law and the civil law at this court. While the requirements of honest contractual performance in the two legal traditions may be rooted in distinct histories, they have come together to address similar issues, at least in the context of dishonest performance. The civil law provides a useful analytical guide to illustrating the relatively recent common law duty. Two reasons in particular underlie the usefulness of the comparative exercise here. First, I stress that I do not rely on the civil law here for the specific rules that would govern a similar claim in Quebec. Rather, within the constraints imposed on this court by the precedent in Basson and the wider common law context, I draw on abuse of rights as a framework to understand the common law duty of honest performance. Second, there is no serious concern here that looking to Quebec will throw the common law into a state of uncertainty. As Justice Cromwell did in Basson, this court can take comfort from the experience of Quebec to allay fears 
that applying this general framework of wrongful exercise of rights will result in commercial uncertainty or inappropriately constrained freedom of contract. Notwithstanding their differences, the common law and the civil law in Quebec share, in respect of good faith, some of the same broad social values that justify comparison generally. As noted, this court pointed to a shared concern for the proper compass of good faith in that it does not require acting to serve the other contracting party's interests in all cases, and both anchor remedies in corrective, not distributive justice. As Professor Moore wrote prior to his appointment as a judge, quote, the value of individual autonomy and the fear that good faith is an imprecise concept are not exclusive to common law. They are discussed at length in civil law commentary and jurisprudence, end quote. For these reasons, it is not inappropriate to illustrate the duty of honest performance using the framework of the wrongful exercise of a right. Dishonesty is directly linked to the performance of a given contract, where it can be said that the exercise of a right or the performance of an obligation under that contract has been dishonest. Applying Basson to this case, and drawing on the illustration provided by the Quebec civil law sources just as Cromwell himself cites, I am of the respectful view that the Court of Appeal erred when it concluded that the dishonesty here was only about a future contract. Properly understood, the alleged dishonesty in this case was directly linked to the performance of the contract because Baycrest's exercise of the termination right provided to it under the contract was dishonest. The termination right was exercised dishonestly according to the trial judge in our case notwithstanding the fact that its terms, the 10-day notice, were otherwise respected. Pointing to the dishonest representations regarding the danger to the contract and made in anticipation of the notice period, she held that the duty to act honestly was linked to the termination of the contract and the exercise of that right in the circumstances was a breach of the contract. The trial judge did not deny the right of Baycrest to terminate the contract, but the manner in which it did so was wrongful, in breach of the duty of honesty, and for that it owed callow damages. Importantly, this does not deny the existence of the termination right, but fixes on the wrongful manner in which it was exercised. 2. Baycrest's conduct constitutes dishonesty. The second issue to be resolved is whether Baycrest's conduct amounts to dishonesty within the meaning of the duty of honest performance in Basson. Callow takes issue with the Court of Appeals' conclusion that while the facts may have suggested a failure to act honorably, they did not rise to the level of a breach of this duty. To dispose of this appeal, then, we must determine what standard of honesty was expected of Baycrest in its exercise of Clause 9. There is common ground that parties to a contract cannot outright lie or tell half-truths in a manner that knowingly misleads a counterparty. It is also agreed here that the failure to disclose a material fact, without more, would not be contrary to the standard. Beyond this, however, the parties continue to disagree about what might constitute knowingly misleading conduct as the idea was alluded to in Basson. Callow argues that while this court in Basson held that the duty of honest performance does not impose a duty of disclosure, it left open the possibility that an omission to inform can nonetheless be knowingly misleading in certain circumstances. Callow acknowledges that the line between a misrepresentation and the innocent failure to disclose is not always easy to draw. But by positively misleading Mr. Callow that the winter maintenance agreement was likely to be renewed in 2014, he was led to infer, mistakenly and to the knowledge of Baycrest, that a decision had not been made to terminate the existing contract in 2013. Failing to correct this false impression, in Callow's view, was a breach of its obligation to act honestly in the performance of the winter maintenance agreement. It meant that Clause 9 was not exercised in keeping with the obligatory duty to perform the contract honestly imposed in Basson. Baycrest submits that active deception, a term invoked by the trial judge as well as both parties, requires actual dishonesty in the sense that an outright lie is necessary. Silence, said its counsel at the hearing, can only constitute misrepresentation when there is a duty to speak. Since the duty of honest performance does not bring with it a duty of disclosure, 
Silence cannot constitute dishonesty or an act of misrepresentation, whether done intentionally or, I suppose, accidentally. Baycrest is right to say that the duty to act honestly does not impose a duty of loyalty or of disclosure or require a party to forego advantages flowing from the contract. Justice Cromwell referred to United Roasters Incorporated and Colgate Palmolive Company in support of his conclusion that the duty of honest performance is distinct from a freestanding duty to disclose information. In United Roasters, the terminating party had decided in advance of the required notice period to terminate the contract. The court held that no disclosure of that intention was required other than what was stipulated in the contract. In Justice Cromwell's view, this made it clear that there is no unilateral duty to disclose information relevant to termination. One might well understand that courts would shy away from imposing a free-standing positive duty to disclose information to a counterparty where it would serve to upset the corrective justice orientation of contract law. Whether or not a positive duty to cooperate of this character should be associated with the principle of good faith performance in the common law, a party to a contract has no general duty to subordinate their interests to that of the other party in the law as it now stands. Requiring a party to speak up in service of the requirements of good faith, where nothing in the party's contractual relationship brings a duty to do so, could be understood to confer an unbargained for benefit on the other that would stand outside the usual compass of contractual justice. Yet where the failure to speak out amounts to active dishonesty in a manner directly related to the performance of the contract, a wrong has been committed, and correcting it does not serve to confer a benefit to the party who has been wronged. To this end, Justice Cromwell clarified that the situation is quite different when it comes to actively misleading or deceiving the other contracting party in relation to performance of the contract. In such circumstances, contractual parties should be mindful to correct misapprehensions, lest a contractual breach of the Basson duty be found. By noting that liability flowed from active dishonesty and not a unilateral duty to disclose, Justice Cromwell indicated that the duty of honesty is cognizant with the ordinary principles of contractual justice. That Basson does not impose a duty to disclose or a fiduciary-type obligation means that performing a contract honestly is not a selfless or altruistic act. One might well say that performing one's own end of a bargain honestly is in keeping with the pursuit of self-interest as long as the law can be counted on to require the same honest conduct from one's counterparty. Whatever constraints it justifies on Baycrest's ability to terminate the contract based on values of honesty associated with good faith, it does not require it to confer a benefit on Callow in exercising that right. As Justice Cromwell explained, having appropriate regard for the legitimate contractual interests of the contracting parties does not require acting to serve those interests in all cases. This explains, to my mind, the limited character of the duty of honesty. It is not a device that allows a court, in the name of a conception of good faith resting on distributive justice, to require the party that has to exercise a contractual right or power to serve the other party's interests at the expense of their own. This emphasis on the corrective justice foundation of the duty to act honestly in performance is, in my view, helpful to understanding why a facially unfettered right is nonetheless constrained by the imperative requirement of good faith explained in Basson. I recall that Justice Cromwell sought to reassure those who feared commercial uncertainty resulting from the recognition of this new duty by explaining that the requirement of honest performance interferes very little with freedom of contract. After all, the expectation that a contract would be performed without lies or deception can already be thought of as a minimum standard that is part of the bargain. I agree with the sentiment expressed by the Chief Justice of Alberta in a case that relied on Basson and Potter. Quote, Companies are entitled to expect that the parties with whom they contract will be honest in their contractual dealings, end quote. In that sense, while the duty is one of mandatory law, in most cases it can be thought of as leaving the agreement and both parties' expectations, the first source of justice between the parties, in place. By extension, requiring that a party exercise a right under the contract in keeping with this minimum standard only precludes the commission of a wrong and thus repairing that breach, where the damage resulted, may be thought of as cognizant with the principles of corrective justice.
where a party has lied or otherwise knowingly misled the other contracting party in respect of a matter that is directly linked to the performance of the contract, it amounts to a breach of contract that must be set right, but the benefits of the bargain need not be otherwise reallocated between the parties involved. That said, I emphasize once again that it is unquestionable that the duty is imposed as a matter of contractual doctrine rather than by implication or interpretation, and, by virtue of its status as contractual doctrine, parties are not free to exclude the duty altogether. Even if the parties, as here, have agreed to a term that provides for an apparently unfettered right to terminate the contract for convenience, that right cannot be exercised in a manner that transgresses the core expectations of honesty required by good faith in the performance of contracts. This framework for measuring the wrongful exercise of the termination right does not turn on Baycrest's motive in exercising Clause 9 beyond the observation that it did so dishonestly. The right of termination was, on its face, one without cause. Baycrest may have had legitimate grievances against Callow or some ulterior motive for its knowing deception. It is of no moment. The negative view that the property manager may have had of Callow, alluded to by the trial judge, is not the source of the breach of the duty of honest performance. Moreover, I note that Justice Cromwell described the requirements of the duty of honesty negatively. While the duty of honest performance does not require parties to act angelically by subordinating their own interests to that of their counterparty, they must refrain from lying or knowingly misleading their counterparty. As a negative obligation, that is, in the absence of a recognized duty to act, the injunction it imposes is one not to act dishonestly, it sits more plainly with the ordinary objectives of corrective justice and what one scholar sees as the traditional posture of the common law in favor of contractual autonomy and individual freedom in private law. It is clear, wrote Professor Daly in a comment on the common law method consecrated in Basson, that the duty of honesty recognized in Basson is a negative obligation, not to lie, rather than a positive obligation to act in good faith. This same orientation has been observed in animating the analogous contractual duty of good faith in the civil law. While positive obligations to cooperate in performance may be otherwise required by the law of good faith, scholars have observed that the notional equivalent of the duty of honest performance in Quebec civil law most typically imposes negative obligations, to refrain from lying, for example, in the measure of the abuse of a contractual right. Care must be taken, I hasten to say, not to confuse the duty to act faithfully, recognized in this regard, with the fiduciary duty of loyalty that stands outside good faith in both legal traditions. I would add that, as Justice Cromwell made plain, the recognition of the duty to act honestly in performance does not necessarily mean that the ideals spoken to in the organizing principle of good faith set forth in Basson might not manifest itself otherwise. Even within the limited compass of corrective justice, circumstances may arise in which the organizing principle would encourage the view that contractual rights must be exercised in a manner that was neither capricious nor arbitrary, for example, or that some duty to cooperate between the parties be imposed through recognizing that, contrary to fiduciary duties, good faith performance does not engage duties of loyalty to the other contracting party or a duty to put the interests of the other contracting party first. But for present purposes, it is not necessary to go that further step. I am of the view that where the exercise of a contractual right is undertaken dishonestly, the exercise is in breach of the contract, and this wrong must be corrected. That is what happened here. The question that remains is whether Baycrest lied to or knowingly misled Callow and thus breached the duty to act honestly. I recognize that in cases where there is no outright lie present, like the case before us, it is not always obvious whether a party knowingly misled its counterparty. Yet, Baycrest is wrong to suggest that nothing stands between the outright lie and silence. Elsewhere, as in the law of misrepresentation, for instance, one encounters examples of courts determining whether a misrepresentation was present, regardless of whether there was some direct lie. As Professor Wadhams has written, quote, an incomplete statement may be as misleading as a false one, and such half-truths have frequently been treated as legally significant misrepresentations, end quote. 
Ultimately, he wrote, it is open to the court to hold that the concealment of the material facts can, when taken with general statements, true in themselves but incomplete, turn those statements into misrepresentations, end quote. Similarly, where a party makes a statement it believes to be true, but later circumstances affect the truth of that earlier statement, courts have found in various contexts that the party has an obligation to correct the misrepresentation. See also Seema May, Bassin and Hrynu, A New Era for Good Faith in Canadian Employment Law or Just Tinkering at the Margins. These examples encourage the view that the requirements of honesty in performance can, and often do, go further than prohibiting outright lies. Indeed, the concept of misleading one's counterparty, the term invoked separately by Justice Cromwell, will in some circumstances capture forms of silence or omissions. One can mislead through action, for example, by saying something directly to its counterparty or through inaction, by failing to correct a misapprehension caused by one's own misleading conduct. To me, these are close cousins in the catalog of deceptive contractual practices. At the end of the day, whether or not a party has knowingly misled its counterparty is a highly fact-specific determination and can include lies, half-truths, omissions, and even silence, depending on the circumstances. I stress that this list is not closed. It merely exemplifies that dishonesty or misleading conduct is not confined to direct lies. No reviewable error has been shown in the finding of dishonesty that took place in anticipation of the exercise of Clause 9 here. I would not interfere with the trial judge's view here on a matter that is owed deference. Deference should be shown to the trial judge in reviewing her discretionary exercise of weighing the evidence, especially given credibility played a part in her analysis, as she explained. Reading the whole of the first instance judgment, I see no consequential error in the account given by the trial judge of the law on the duty of honest performance. She did not base her conclusions on some freestanding duty to disclose information. Instead, she examined whether Baycrest knowingly misled Callow as to the standing of the winter maintenance agreement, and thus wrongfully exercised its right of termination. Despite this, however, Baycrest argues that the trial judge erred in failing to recognize that its conduct did not reach the much higher standards spoken to in Basson. I disagree. No such error has been shown. It is helpful for our purposes to recall on the facts in Basson, part of the dishonest conduct concerned the respondent Can-Am's plans to reorganize its activities in Alberta. Its plan contemplated invoking its contractual right of non-renewal to force a merger between Mr. Basson and his competitor, Mr. Hrynu. In effect, this reorganization would have given Mr. Basson's business to Mr. Hrynu. Can-Am, however, had said nothing of its plan to Mr. Basson. When Mr. Basson first heard of the merger plans, he questioned an official of Can-Am about its intentions. The official equivocated, Justice Cromwell explained, and did not tell him the truth that from Canam's perspective, this was a done deal. Justice Cromwell later concluded that Canam's breach of contract consisted of its failure to be honest with Mr. Basson about its contractual performance, and in particular, with respect to its settled intentions with respect to renewal. Justice Cromwell wrote, quote, The trial judge made a clear finding of fact that Canam acted dishonestly towards Basson in exercising the non renewal clause. There is no basis to interfere with that finding on appeal. It follows that Canam breached its duty to perform the agreement honestly. End quote. It is true that Baycrest remained silent about its decision to terminate Callow's contract and that Clause 9 on its face did not impose on it a duty to disclose its intention, except for on the 10-day notice requirement. That said, it had to refrain, as the trial judge said, from deceiving Callow through a series of active communications. When it failed to refrain from doing so in anticipation of exercising its termination right, it deceived Callow into thinking it would leave the existing winter services agreement intact. These active communications, as I understand the trial judge's findings of fact, came in two forms. 
First, Mr. P.X. Soto made statements to Mr. Callow suggesting that a renewal of the winter maintenance agreement was likely. As the trial judge found, quote, after his discussions with Mr. P.X. Soto and Mr. Campbell, Mr. Callow thought he was likely to get a two-year renewal of his winter maintenance services contract, and it was satisfied with his services under the existing agreement, which had one winter to run. The assumption is also supported by the documentary evidence, especially by the private emails between Mr. P.X. Soto and Mr. Campbell, end quote. Baycrest attempts to recast the significance of this finding, arguing that Mr. Callow only had casual discussions with two of the JUC members, Mr. P.X. Soto and Mr. Campbell, about the possibility of a contract renewal. Such casual discussions, it says, cannot rise to the level of a lie. That position ignores the key finding in the trial judge's reasons that it was Mr. P.X. Soto, the JUC member who negotiated the main pricing terms with Callow for the winter maintenance agreement, who made statements to Mr. Callow suggesting that a renewal was likely. After making credibility findings against Mr. P.X. Soto, the trial judge found that he had led Mr. Callow to believe that all was fine with the winter contract and that Baycrest was interested in a future extension of Callow's contracts. This dishonesty did not take place in the abstract. The trial judge found it to be relevant to the exercise of Clause 9. The second form of active communications that deceived Callow was related to the freebies Callow had offered Baycrest in the summer of 2013. As the trial judge found, Callow performed this free work because Mr. Callow wanted to provide an incentive for Baycrest to renew the winter maintenance agreement. Baycrest, for its part, gladly accepted the services offered by Callow. Again, Baycrest attempts to recast the significance of these findings, arguing that there is nothing inherently unlawful or unfair about accepting a contractor's incentives offered in the hopes of securing a new contract or the renewal of an existing contract. Whether or not that is the case, I again stress that Mr. P.X. Soto understood that the work performed by Callow was a freebie to add an incentive for the boards to renew his winter maintenance services contract and advised Mr. Callow that he would tell the other board members about this work. These active communications by Baycrest suggested, deceptively, that there was hope for renewal and, perforce, the current contract would not be terminated. Considering Baycrest's conduct as a whole over those few months, it was certainly reasonable for Mr. Callow, who was led to believe that a renewal was likely, to infer that Baycrest had not decided to terminate the ongoing contract. Moreover, Baycrest knew Mr. Callow was under this false impression, as shown by the email sent by Mr. P.X. Soto on July 17, 2013, and, nonetheless, continued to give him the impression that a renewal was likely even though the decision to terminate him was made. Upon realizing that Mr. Callow was under this false impression, Baycrest should have corrected the misapprehension. In the circumstances, its conduct misled Callow. I respectfully disagree with the idea that the deception in this case only concerned termination for unsatisfactory services and did not extend to termination for any other reason. The trial judge found that the dishonest conduct involved representations that the contract was not in danger at all when Baycrest knew it would be terminated. The Court of Appeal did not interfere with these findings, nor has Baycrest argued that the trial judge made any palpable and overriding error. Accordingly, in light of the trial judge's findings of fact, I agree that Baycrest intentionally withheld information in anticipation of exercising Clause 9, knowing that such silence, when combined with its active communications, had deceived Callow. By failing to correct Mr. Callow's misapprehension thereafter, Baycrest breached its constitutional duty of honest performance. This is in stark contrast to United Roadsters, where the defendant merely withheld its decision to terminate the agreement. Unlike in this case, the defendant there did not engage in a series of acts that it knew would cause the plaintiff to draw an incorrect inference and then fail to correct the plaintiff's misapprehension. In this sense, this case is broadly similar to Dunning and Royal Bank, one of the examples of breaches of the duty to exercise good faith in the manner of dismissal provided by Justice Yakabuchi in support of his conclusions in Wallace.
while it was decided in the distinctive good faith setting of the employment context, Dunning is an appropriate analogy to the present case because in Basson, Justice Cromwell explicitly recognized that the duty of honesty was a key component of the good faith requirements which have been recognized in relation to termination of employment contracts. It seems to me that if the duty of honest performance was a key component of the good faith requirements spoken to in Wallace and Keyes, a similar framework applies, again bound together through the organizing principle. As Justice Yakabuchi explained, the employee's job in Dunning had been eliminated, but the employer told him another position would probably be found for him and the new assignment would necessitate a transfer. While the employee was being reassured about his future, the employer was contemplating his termination. Eventually, the employer chose to terminate the employee, but withheld that information from the employee for some time, despite knowing the employee was in the process of selling his home in anticipation of the transfer. News of the termination only came after the employee had sold his home. Such conduct, Justice Yakabuchi observed, clearly violated the expected standard of good faith in the manner of dismissal. As Dunning, Wallace, and Keyes make plain, an employer has the right to terminate an employment contract without cause, subject to the duty to provide reasonable notice. However broad that right may be, however, an unhappy employee can allege a distinct contractual breach when the employer has mistreated them in the manner of dismissal. In the end, as Justice Cromwell noted, Contracting parties must be able to rely on a minimum standard of honesty from their contracting partner in relation to performing the contract as a reassurance that if the contract does not work out, they will have a fair opportunity to protect their interests. When Baycrest deliberately remained silent, while knowing that Mr. Callow had drawn the mistaken inference the contract was in good standing because it was likely to be renewed, it breached the duty to act honestly. In my view, the trial judge did not create a new duty of disclosure in correcting that wrong, but rather sought to denounce Baycrest's conduct. Remedying that with an order for damages to repair Baycrest's failure to exercise Clause 9 in accordance with the requirements of the duty of honest performance did not confer a benefit on Callow. It merely set matters right on the usual measure of corrective justice following this breach of contract. Respectfully stated, it is therefore my view that the Court of Appeal erred in concluding that Baycrest's conduct was dishonorable but not dishonest. I would note, however, that I do agree in part with the Court of Appeal's observation that the trial judge went too far in concluding that, quote, the minimum standard of honesty would have been to address the alleged performance issues, to provide prompt notice, or to refrain from any representations in anticipation of the notice period, end quote. In my respectful view, to impute these first two requirements would amount to altering the bargain struck between the parties substantively, a conclusion not sought by Callow before this court. That said, I agree with the trial judge that at a minimum, Baycrest had to refrain from false representations in anticipation of the notice period. Having failed to correct Mr. Callow's misapprehension that arose during these false representations, I too would recognize a contractual breach on the part of Baycrest in the exercise of its right to termination in Clause 9. Damages thus flow for the consequential loss of opportunity, a matter to which I now turn. Subpart C. Baycrest submits that Callow is not entitled to any damages for the breach. Baycrest argues that the trial judge erred in fixing the quantum of damages, first by awarding Callow its expected profits over the full balance of the contract, Second, by misapprehending the evidence relating to Callow's expenses. And finally, by awarding both the loss of profit and the expenses incurred. On the first point, I note that the trial judge correctly proceeded on the premise that due to the breach of contract, Callow is entitled to be placed in the same position as if the breach had not occurred. Indeed, as Justice Cromwell explained in Basson, Breach of the duty of honest contractual performance supports a claim for damages according to the ordinary contractual measure. The ordinary approach is to award contractual damages corresponding to the expectation interest. That is, damages should put Callow in the position that it would have been had the duty been performed. While it has rightly been observed that reliance damages and expectation damages will be the same in many if not most cases, They are nevertheless conceptually distinct, 
As Professor Stephen Smith wrote, quote, defendants are ordered to do what they promised to do, not to do whatever is necessary to ensure the claimant is not harmed by relying on the promise, end quote. Damages corresponding to the reliance interest are the ordinary measure of damages in tort. This measure may be appropriate where it would be difficult for the plaintiff to prove the position they would have been in had the contract been performed. Reliance damages in contract mean putting the injured party in the position it would have been had it not entered into the contract at all. I see no basis to hold that a breach of the duty of honest performance should in general be compensated by way of reliance damages. I recall that the duty of honest performance is a doctrine of contract law. Its breach is not a tort. Nor would basing damages in this case on the reliance interests set this contractual breach apart from the ordinary measure of contractual damages. But it would depart from the measure as it was applied in Basson. In my respectful view, there is no basis to depart from Basson on this point, which, in any event, was not argued by the parties. Further, I note that this view is shared by authors who have written that the duty of honest performance protects a party's expectation interest rather than reliance interest. Finally, while reliance damages and expectation damages coincide on the facts here, there is good reason to retain, in my view, the ordinarily applicable measure of contractual damages that seeks to provide the plaintiff with what they had expected. Professor Wadhams has written that this can have a positive deterrent effect. Quote, one of the legitimate arguments in favor of the current rule and against a rule measuring damages only by the plaintiff's reliance is that a rule protecting only reliance would fail to deter breach in a large number of cases where the defendant calculated that the plaintiff's provable losses were less than the cost of performance, end quote. Baycrest nevertheless argues that the trial judge did not actually consider what position Calla would be in if it had fulfilled the duty and instead awarded the value of the balance of the winter maintenance agreement. In doing so, it argues, she fell into the same error as the trial judge in Basson, who simply awarded damages as though the contract had been renewed. Baycrest says that this court has appropriately condemned this approach because the parties did not intend or presume a perpetual contract. Moreover, Baycrest points to Hamilton and Open Window Bakery Limited for the proposition that damages are assessed by the mode of performance which is least burdensome to the defendant. Callow, it is said, is entitled to no more than the minimum that Baycrest was obligated to do pursuant to the contract. Since Clause 9 allowed it to terminate the winter maintenance agreement at any point on 10 days' notice, no damages should flow. In my view, Hamilton is of no assistance to Baycrest in this case. While Justice Cromwell referenced this principle in Basson, He did so in the context of whether the court should recognize a broad, freestanding duty of good faith for which the appellant there had argued. Briefly stated, the appellant's position was that the respondent, Can-Am, would have been in breach of such a duty since it had attempted to use the non-renewal clause to force Mr. Basson into merger. Justice Cromwell declined to recognize such a broad duty, reasoning that Can-Am's contractual liability would still have to be measured by reference to the least onerous means of performance, which in this case would have meant simply not renewing the contract. Because no damages would have flowed from this breach, it was unnecessary for the court to decide whether a broad, freestanding duty of good faith should be recognized. It bears emphasizing that despite Justice Cromwell's comments related to Hamilton, he nonetheless awarded damages to the appellant flowing from the breach of the respondent's obligation to perform the contract honestly. Damages were awarded using the ordinary measure of contractual expectation damages, namely to put Mr. Basson in the position he would have been had Can-Am not breached its obligation to behave honestly in the exercise of the non-renewal clause. This resulted in Mr. Basson being compensated for the value of his business that eroded. As Professors O'Byrne and Cohen helpfully explain, quote, if Canam had dealt with Basson honestly on all fronts, though without requiring it to disclose its intention not to renew, Basson would have realized much sooner that his relationship with Canam was in tremendous jeopardy and reached a breaking point. He could have taken proactive steps to protect his business, instead of seeing it in effect expropriated and turned over to Mr. Freinu, end quote. <laughs>
How is it that damages were awarded for a breach of the duty of honest performance despite the principle outlined in Hamilton? While damages are to be measured against a defendant's least onerous means of performance, the least onerous means of performance in this case would have been to correct the misrepresentation once Baycrest knew Callow had drawn a false inference. Had it done so, Callow would have had the opportunity to secure another contract for the upcoming winter. As Callow explained at the hearing, since this dishonesty caused Callow a loss by inducing it not to bid on other contracts during the summer of 2013 for the winter of 2013 to 2014, the condos are liable to it for damages, which reflects its lost opportunity arising out of its abuse of Clause 9. It may be true that the trial judge could have explained her rationale for awarding damages more plainly. But even if the trial judge fell into the same error that the trial judge in Basson committed, so as to award damages as though the contract had carried on, it was one of no consequence. As the trial judge found, Baycrest failed to provide a fair opportunity for Callow to protect its interests. Had Baycrest acted honestly in exercising its right of termination and thus corrected Mr. Callow's false impression, Callow would have taken proactive steps to bid on another contract for the upcoming winter. Indeed, there was ample evidence before the trial judge that Callow had opportunities to bid on other winter maintenance contracts in the summer of 2013, but chose to forego those opportunities due to Mr. Callow's misapprehension as to the status of the contract with Baycrest. In any event, even if I were to conclude that the trial judge did not make an explicit finding as to whether Callow lost an opportunity, it may be presumed as a matter of law that it did, since it was Baycrest's own dishonesty that now precludes Callow from conclusively proving what would have happened if Baycrest had been honest. In the result, I see no palpable and overriding error. I am satisfied that if Baycrest's dishonesty had not deprived Callow of the opportunity to bid on other contracts, then Callow would have made an amount that was at least equal to the profit it lost under the winter maintenance agreement. The trial judge found that once expenses are deducted, that award amounts to $64,306.96. I see no reason to interfere with her fact-finding as to the estimation of expenses. Consequently, I see no basis for overturning this portion of the trial judge's award of damages. The trial judge also awarded Callow $14,835.14, representing the cost of leasing a piece of machinery for one year. Mr. Callow testified that he had leased the machinery specifically for the winter maintenance agreement, but would not have had he known the contract would be terminated. Baycrest submits that the trial judge erred by awarding these expenses because it amounts to double recovery. I see no issue of double recovery in this case. The trial judge awarded $64,306.96 as lost profit, not lost revenue. This is appropriate because Callow was not actually hired for the other contract on which it did not bid, and therefore did not necessarily have to undertake all the expenses that would have been required to fulfill that contract. However, as Callow had already committed to this expense, the lease of the machinery, it should too be compensated for along with lost profit. The trial judge was entitled to decide this point as she did, having the advantage of measuring losses firsthand. I see no reviewable error in the trial judge's approach on this issue. Part 5. Disposition I would allow the appeal, set aside the order of the Court of Appeal, and reinstate the judgment of the trial judge with costs throughout. Thanks for the listen, friend. I hope you're able to enjoy that case and learn something new from it. Legal Listening is founded by Zach Battiston and Carly Lyons. It is hosted by Zach Battiston, Carly Lyons, and you, our listeners. Executive produced by Zach Battiston, Carly Lyons, and Anthony Rademile. Audio engineering by Anthony Rademile. Graphic design by Julie Lundy. Check her out online at julielundyart.com. And music done by Matt Rademile at radandkel.com. At Legal Listening, we're always open to new ideas, suggestions, and of course, guest readers. Check us out on Twitter at Legal Listening or online at LegalListening.com. Legal Listening, where audio obiter is our thing. We'll catch you in the next case. Bye now.